Well, good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome, whether it is in person here at the SAO or whether it is virtually anywhere in the world. And of course, a particular welcome to our speaker tonight, all the way from the UK, Alex Anderson. Uh, Alex is a PhD student at the University of Oxford, and his work is focusing on the roles of machine learning and citizen science on the uh, Getting through the vast amounts of data in the SKA era. Over to you, Alex. Thank you so much for coming. Brilliant. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, really excited to speak to you all. Um, so I couldn't be there in person. I've, I've been to visit SAAO uh, a couple of times now. It's always been lovely to, to visit. So, so uh, yeah, um, hope everyone's well. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be speaking about uh, how citizen science can be a fantastic tool for discovering interesting, transient things in the era of the SKA. Um, and this is work I've done, yeah, as, uh, as Christian said, as, as sort of the bulk of my PhD. Uh, and I do this as part of the Thundercat collaboration, which is a, a survey project on Meerkat um, and people who build the Zooniverse platform, which I'll get onto in a second, and uh, several thousand members of the public, uh, which has been really, really exciting. Um, so uh, I'll start with the telescope that probably needs no introduction, but all my work uh, uses Meerkat, uh, this, you know, fantastic facility up in the, in the Karoo in the Northern Cape. Um, I was lucky enough to get a chance to visit um, this, uh, this this July, and uh, it's phenomenal to go and see, and, and it really is leading the way in terms of doing the kind of work that I'm interested in and lots of other fantastic science. Um, so everything I'm talking about today is stuff I've done uh, as part of my PhD with Meerkat, but a lot of the methods could be applied with other telescopes. Um, so um, I mentioned that I'm part of the Thundercat survey, so here's a slightly uh, grainy uh, video of where the Thundercat survey, which takes images on Meerkat, um, points the telescope um, on the date given in the bottom left here. So we sort of take these quite regular observations every week, every couple of weeks of different parts of the sky, mostly in the galactic plane, looking at things um, that are changing in the sky uh, with the radio telescope. So one of the main aims for Thundercats um, is looking for X-ray binaries, which I'll get onto in a second. Um, but for, for the purposes of my science, it's just important that the Thundercat survey takes regular pictures of the sky with Meerkat that I can use to find interesting things changing, disappearing, appearing, um, things that we refer to as transient. Um, so you can see a lot of our observations are, are centered in the galactic plane, um, if you go through the middle of this, uh, this image. Um, and that's because that's where a lot of the stars are, um, basically. Um, people who are interested in things exploding in, in other galaxies wouldn't necessarily be looking in this location, but these are the images that I've I've been using as part of my work. Um, uh, let's just go. So I like to define this, this term commensalism, which has really come to sort of define a lot of my uh, PhD. So commensalism, it sort of means eating at the same table as, um, and originally comes from a sort of ecological setting where you have uh, two species and, and, and one, and they sort of interact with each other and one species gains benefit from that, whereas the other one doesn't. So this is like when you have um, sort of fish that will hitch a ride on the back of a larger fish, for example. Um, in an astronomer's context, of course, this 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 isn't to do with the fish. This is, uh, you know, if you take your pictures of the sky for your science case, so in this case, uh, the things that the Thundercat team are interested in, then I can use those science for completely complementary um, investigation into the things I care about. So everything I'm going to show you was observations we had anyway, and it's sort of this is all bonus science that doesn't cost anything in terms of uh, telescope time. There's zero additional hours of telescope time here. So just to, to, to really hammer home that point, um, this uh, is a really lovely um, picture of the Cirsten SX-1 field taken by my, my colleague, Caleb Ohile, um, who's at UCT. And if you care about Cirsten SX-1, you care about this earlobe-shaped thing in the middle. As you can see, there's a sort of interesting little structure in there. And you know maybe if this was discovered back in the day, you would call it an earlobe nebula or something. But hopefully, um, you can all get the point that there's lots and lots of other stuff in this image. There's interesting diffuse structures and H2 regions. Uh, star forming areas and lots of these little dots in the back, probably some some AGN and, and other distant radio galaxies. And really, with Meerkat is is fantastic for this. When Meerkat is fantastically sensitive um, to really faint emission, um, but also um, at the frequencies it observes uh, and the baselines it has, uh, you get really wide fields of view on the sky. So every uh, every picture taken of the sky at 1.3 gigahertz with Meerkat covers about twice the full moon on the sky, over a square degree. Um, so we're getting you know, relatively large patches of the sky taken regularly with high sensitivity, 
And that combination of sensitivity, regular cadence, and wide you know, patches of sky means that we can do the kind of interesting science and finding lots of things in the sky that are disappearing or appearing or transient things that I, I, I'm sort of interested in finding. Um, so, you know, if things on the outside here, we, we, you know, are changing over time, for example. Um, I thought I should also define what, what other kind of transient things I'm talking about. Um, so I'll start close to home, um, just give a bit of a sort of astrophysics of, of why we might care about these things. Um, so let's start close to home. The things that are, might be disappearing or appearing in radio telescopes near us are sort of radio loud stars. So on the top right here is a um, artist's impression of Proxima Centauri and uh, uh, it's a uh, it's, uh, planet going around it. Um, and we see these sort of flares. We see a lot of solar flares on our own sun, but we also see stellar flares uh, on other uh, stars in our galaxy. And these are also visible in, in with radio telescopes. So in the bottom here, I've got a GIF of um, a radio transit. You can see there's nothing in, in a lot of these images. And then something like pops in and then pops out again in the images, that little sort of yellow thing that shows up for one or two images. That's a star. Um, and that star is, is has a sort of flare. At that, that, that time we took the image, we happened to catch it with the um, images we were taking from Meerkat. Um, and the yellowness is just how bright it is. As we can see, this thing pops into appearance, then disappears again. Um, and these stellar flares have a lot of implications for you know what's going on in these stars and how active they are. And if there was any unfortunate uh, planets near these stars, if that you know would mean um, you know nasty coronal mass ejections or lots of UV radiation uh, hitting the the atmosphere of those those planets, for example. So that's quite interesting. Um, on the left here, I've got a, a picture of I think this is a, a Wolf Rayet star taken by this is from Hubble, so this isn't is radio image, but it's illustrating my point that another kind of interesting star that we see. Uh, with the radio telescopes are OH Maser stars. So these are stars that have a sort of dusty atmosphere around them. They are sort of through the main sequence of their lives. And in this sort of puffed up atmosphere around them, uh, you end up getting uh, essentially uh, laser-like qualities in space where particular uh, molecules, for example, um, uh, OH uh, molecules, um, get excited by the light from that star. And we can see that sort of excitement um, and, and de-excitation at radio wavelengths. Um, so and I'll show another example of one of these later. This is just a, a lovely drawing, a picture from, from Hubble that I couldn't help but show. So interesting things from nearby stars. Um, elsewhere in our galaxy, I mentioned extra binaries briefly earlier. We also see um, radio transient behavior from, from these. Um, so extra binaries are, are sort of black holes and neutron stars uh, with unlucky companions, basically. So this is Artis schematic shows a nice uh, drawing of a, a, a black hole in the middle with this sort of accretion disk around it and these two jets sticking out. Uh, and then a companion star, which is sort of losing its mass into that accretion disk. Uh, and these are interesting systems for, for a lot of reasons. But one of the things that I think is coolest about them is that um, these things show you know, real-time evolution of giant blobs of plasma flying through space near the speed of light. So these two uh, panels on the right here, uh, this sort of one still here, and then this, this sort of GIF that we'll loop through, are two examples of X-ray binaries that show, these are, these are both taken with Meerkat, these images, I should say. Uh, you see this sort of one component um, on this one in the middle that sort of stays there and these other sort of smaller components of the image that sort of seem to move away from the sensor. And the same on the right hand side here, you see sort of it starts off in the middle and then you'll see these two blobs move sort of north and south. So the south one gets brighter first and the north one gets brighter and the sort of they both fade away eventually. And these are you know, giant blobs of plasma moving near the speed of light shot out into the environment around the, these black holes, which is just you know amazing. There's There's no other sort of um, laboratory where we can understand, you know, such high energy and high speed plasmas. Um, so they're really interesting for lots of reasons. Um, so those are things in our galaxy. Let's take a little step further away. Um, supernova can be can be really interesting um, uh, radio emitters. Um, so I, again, I couldn't help but show these really nice pictures of, of a supernova outshining its its host galaxy, and these have really interesting uh, radio properties when we see them interacting with our environment, for example. Um, so that's another thing we can see that is a transient thing with radio telescopes. Um, I'm just I'm going to show a nice couple of nice movies now. So we also see sometimes uh, unfortunate stars getting ripped apart by black holes in the middle of their galaxies. And these are called tidal disruption events. And this is, again, an artist schematic of that. So you see this star getting shredded. And again, these sort of this sort of disk and these jets that come out of it. And we see these in external galaxies. And they're really exciting ways of understanding uh, galaxies out there in the universe and understanding the black holes in those galaxies, uh, which otherwise would pretty, be pretty hard to, to get a handle on. Um, and finally, just to, to, to finish on, um, we also sometimes see things colliding 
uh, in the universe. And again, those collisions can create um, these jets that we see. That's pretty pretty much um, always something that's important for 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 the production of radio emission. So you see these jets that stick out here in the end of this this collision between two two neutron stars. Um, so you know I, I'm not expecting any of that to go down, um, you know, word for word, but the point is there is lots of things in our galaxy and outside of our galaxy that produce radio emission, and we have lots and lots of pictures from meerkats to find them. Um, of course, having lots and lots of pictures um, means that someone's going to look through those, and you know, one PhD student couldn't possibly look through all of them. We have many terabytes of data, many, many hundreds and thousands of images to look through. Um, and you know, I don't really fancy spending three and a half years of my PhD looking through many, many pictures. Um, so that's where citizen science comes in. So I'm going to talk now about the Zooniverse platform, which is a people-powered research platform where volunteers and lovely members of the public uh, and anyone can get involved in research and uh, yeah, take part in, in science, basically. So to date, the Zooniverse has had uh, three quarters of a million classifications from over two and a half million people. So that's a lot of eyeballs looking at a lot of interesting things. Um, there's lots of astronomy projects. I'm going to talk about mine. And here are a few of those here. So basically, if there's any kind of astronomy you like, there's probably a Zooniverse project for it. Um, if you're interested in finding planets, there's there's planet hunting uh, uh, Zooniverse project uh, where you can help uh, find um, planets in interesting light curves. There's some interesting... Um, stuff on, on galaxies. Galaxy Zoo, many of you may have heard of, is the, the, a very long running um, citizen science project or things close to home like Aurora or a, a Citizen Assassin looks at interesting stars, for example. So all sorts of interesting astronomy projects to get involved in. Um, there, there are also a lot of uh, non-astronomy projects, I should say. There, we've got lots of ecology projects as well. So, you know, sort of camera traps set up in the Serengeti or in the jungle or, or you know, underwater and, uh, you know, asking volunteers to, to see what, say what animals are in the uh, the, the the pictures and that can help you understand where those animals live and how the, their sort of habitats change over time. So it's a really fantastic tool, um, and hopefully I'm going to convince you that it's a fantastic tool for finding the transients, um, which I've sort of showed a few of just now. So we launched launched our own um, Zooniverse project, our citizen science project, on the platform, and here's a sort, uh, sort of screenshot of the classification workflow where volunteers can get engaged. Completely open, and I'll, I'll do a little live demo. Um, later and hopefully that'll work. Um, we did a sort of first data release, the R1, uh, which had about 9,000 um, things to look at, basically. Um, and when I say 9,000 things, what I mean is we show all of our volunteers um, what you can see on the screen here. So one light curve. Um, so this light curve on the top here is just a measure of the brightness of the thing in, the, in, in our pictures changing over time. So if we have you know 20 uh, pictures of one, one part of sky, you'll see 20 points in that light curve of something um, and seeing if its brightness changes or not. And that's sort of the main clue to as if something is variable or transient, um, which are the things I care about. So for the example here on the right, you can see this light curve clearly starts quite low and then gets very bright and then faint again, and then a bit bright and then faint again. So this is clearly showing sort of variable behavior over a time scale of what's this from 2019 to 2021, over a couple of years. We also show this image here, this sort of pixelated image here. Um, and this is just uh, one snapshot um, of what this part of the sky looks like. Um, and this sort of color bar here is how bright the thing in the sky is. Um, so it should be centered, it should be the thing right in the center, um, showing sort of the, how this thing looks in the sky. Um, and we're looking for things that are sort of variable. So where this light curve shows this interesting up and down behavior. Um, and we're looking for things that are point sources. And when I say point sources, uh, what I mean is things that are about the size of this yellow circle here, right? So. Um, that's the PSF of, of Meerkat. So anything that's, that's bigger than that is not, not what we're interested in. Um, and I'll get to why now. Um, so sometimes um, we see, again, with the fantastic sensitivity of Meerkat, we see these brilliant extended structures um, in Meerkat, like this one on the bottom left here, this sort of blobby um, radio galaxy. Um, um, these aren't things that we expect to be variable on the timescales that are, I, I've got images from. Um, so any variability that we see from these blobby things is probably something not intrinsic to um, the objects. And so we sort of don't want to keep those. Um, we do want to keep um, the things that look like just little dots. So that's why we have this check. If I go back to thing, uh, we ask people to, to classify things in, in a few ways. And we have one thing to say, if there was an extended blob, say that it's that, um, and then press done. And then um, we, can, we can sort of know that that's not, not, not one of the things we're after. 
I should say as well, um, there is a tutorial that which, which I'll show you guys in, in, in a bit and a field guide and all sorts of, of sort of help texts to sort of um, aid people with it. There's also sort of specific forum boards where you can sort of comment on individual things of interest. And uh, it's been really great interacting with volunteers about um, sources that I think look particularly interesting or interesting shapes in, in images or the light curves. Um, it's been really fun. So yeah, so they might have these those extended blobs that I just showed you. Um, when I say stable here on, on the right here, that just means when the light curve here is just sort of a flat line and there's no clear uh, varying in it. Um, an artifact is, is just something where the, uh, the way the image has been made um, makes it look like there's something there, but it isn't. So those can be a bit hard to find. Um, we haven't actually seen too many of those, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, and then the transient variables are the things, of course, that we're after. And you, you can also say you're unsure. That's perfectly reasonable, you know, um, and that gives us a, a good sense of, of if something's, you know, clearly a transient or if it's a bit, if, if, it, is, if it is a bit unsure. Um, so I showed you these, these images. The other thing we show you are these light curves. Um, so I'll show a couple of those here. Um, so we want these things to be varying. So this thing on the right hand side here, you can see um, there's a clear measurement at, at this particular brightness. This, this flux density measurement is just, just basically brightness um, of the source. And you can see it's this bright. And then we don't see it for several weeks. Um, so there's, there's non-detection. So these arrows pointing down mean we looked in that part of the image, we didn't see anything. And then it gets really bright and then down again and really bright and down again. Um, so that's the kind of thing we want, this sort of clearly varying behavior. Um, and then this one on the left here is sort of interesting as you can see it's um, much fainter. These numbers are, are much smaller than these ones. But the uncertainties, which are these sort of straight lines on the, on the data are, are much larger. So you can't really say clearly if this thing is varying. You know, these points are, are you know, slightly offset from each other, but given the size of the uncertainties, these error bars, you know, we, we can't say that it's actually definitely a, a varying or transient thing. And this gap that you'll see in some of the data is just there are no, no pictures of this part of the sky taken there. And this is the, the current data release we have live. So I'll, I'll show a few more examples of this in the demo. Um, so that's sort of everything we want. So this is the kind of object we might be looking for with the citizen science projects where we see a clearly varying light curve. This thing goes down and up again, no observations, and then down again. Uh, and clearly it's just the size of a dot. Um, so these are the kind of things we want to find. Um, and, and, and then we sort of, once we've found a selection of these, we then go off and, and um, do further study and see, you know, are these nearby stars, are these distant galaxies, uh, this kind of thing. Um, so that was our first data release and sort of how that works. So how did it go is, is a reasonable question. And also it went pretty well. We had about 90,000 classifications in three months, which uh, works out as about a click every minute, which was, was fantastic. I mean, we had yeah, basically, you know, people helping my work and getting engaged and, and, you know, getting through it at a really rapid rate. So that was really fan fantastic. Um, we had over a thousand volunteers get, take take part in the project, um, and it was really great to speak to everyone involved. Um, what I'm showing on the right here is a sort of histogram of how many things on the website were classified by how many volunteers. Um, so you can see most volunteers don't do that many, and that's perfectly fine. We don't expect people to dedicate, you know, tens of hours. But some people did, did loads. Some people did 20, 40, 60, 80. One person even did almost the entire sample um, of of things we had on the website which was just fantastic to have these sort of super users um, sort of taking part and imparting their knowledge onto other volunteers, for example, um, which was really great. Um, and I said we had about 9,000 light curves. We had about, um, well, it was about, about 8,000, uh, yeah, 8,900. Um, we get 10 people to look at each one, and that way we can sort of um, take an average over those. Um, so, you know, if, if nine people say something is an interesting variable thing and one person says they're unsure, it's probably a transient thing. But if nine people say it's a stable light curve and one person says it's a transient, it's probably not, uh, not a transient. So what we do is we take those sort of 10 votes on each um, thing in the sky and we take everything where four out of 10 or more say something was a transient and we take a look through those, see which ones look interesting. Um, and from that, we found 168 variables and transients um, from our volunteers. So that's 2% of the things that we were looking for. So this is a bit of a needle in a haystack situation. We have 9,000 to begin with, and that takes us down to 200, uh, less than 200. Uh, this is fantastic, right? This means that these are things that our volunteers found. That I would have taken, you know, years to, to get through that data, uh, which is brilliant. Um, uh, another thing, you know, that's reasonable to check is, you know, would we have found these things with any other methods? And I won't go into this uh, in, in too much detail, but one of the sort of standard ways of doing this is, is having these uh, two parameters. Uh, one of which is something to do with how much something changes and one is to do with how, how significantly it changes. And I just flashed this graph up to show 
Um, anything that's in this this sort of color scheme here, the purple to blue to yellow, is something that our, our volunteers said was a transient or variable. That's the 168. And the point is that a lot of these things are buried in this clump of the plot where all the rest of the stuff is. Um, and if I was trying to find these things by myself, I would have to look through all of this stuff to find them. So our volunteers have found things that we wouldn't have found otherwise. And that's a real success story to me. They also find a lot of the things that we sort of knew was there already, the things that we were pointing the telescope at. Um, so that sort of verifies that they can find the things we knew about. They can find a whole bunch more that we didn't know about and we wouldn't have found otherwise. And I'm going to show you a couple of nice examples of those as well. Um, so I mentioned these OH Mesa systems briefly earlier. So that sort of cool um, star with the sort of dusty atmosphere around it. Um, so again, you've got this sort of clearly variable light curve on the right here. Um, you don't see anything for a few weeks. And then um, we see this thing changing in brightness a lot over time. And this GIF will sort of flop in, flip it and flop in and out and uh, um, yeah, show you the brightness changing. Uh, if you look with optical telescopes, that's what this, this picture down on the, the bottom here is. There's nothing there at all. It's it completely um, completely uh, obscured by, by dust. But if you look with mid-infrared telescopes, you see this thing that's sort of saturatingly bright. It's really got these sort of diffraction spikes sticking out of it. It's a really bright thing in the infrared. Um, so we did a bit of, I did a bit more digging on this, spoke to a few people um, who know a lot more about this than me. And uh, it turns out this thing uh, is what we call a Myra variable. So this is a, a star that's, uh, as I said, past the end of its, its main, main sequence life and sort of pulsing quite slowly um, and pulsing and it has this dusty atmosphere around it. Um, and in that atmosphere is this OH line um, um, of oxygen and hydrogen. And these sort of pulsations are meant to sort of uh, affect how much that, um, that sort of line gets excited and that should sort of affect the variation we see here. And we also know this star has a, a companion. So these are two stars going around each other, which might have something to do with why this light curve goes up and down like this. I, I still don't know fully and we're gonna do a few more investigations on this, but it's a really interesting example of, of something that we weren't expecting to find, uh, or at least I wasn't, and, and something that our volunteers did find. That's something in our galaxy, um, it's something outside of our galaxy as well. So again, this really intriguing uh, light curve shape here. So you see this thing goes up and down and up again. Um, and you know, our volunteers found this and thought it looked really interesting. Um, this is probably a uh, distant radio galaxy um, that is varying for, for one reason or another. Um, still not 100% sure why it's varying like this. It might be something's changing in that galaxy, or it might be that um, between us and that galaxy, this thing is sort of scintillating um, in the same way that sort of stars twinkle in the night sky. Um, we couldn't find anything uh, with other telescopes for this source. Uh, and this is because if you remember that um, GIF I showed you right at the beginning, a lot of our observations are taken right in the middle of the galactic plane. So you know any optical counterpart would be probably extincted beyond uh, being seen. Um, but it's probably the core of a, a distant galaxy we expect. Uh, and this sort of light curve shape was so sort of um, pleasing to one vol volunteers that they they sort of commented on the on the talk forum and saying, this variable is so perfect, they raked through the metadata to see if it was a simulation. Because some projects throw in sort of um, fake data to test participants to see if they agree with the experts, for example. Um, they, said, they said, this is so crazy, this is real. It's just too perfect. And bravo space. So, I mean, if you're going to take anything away from this talk, just taking away Bravo space, I, you know, that's a good message to, to, to go away with, I think. Um, so Bravo space, there's another interesting, weird thing we can find. Um, so that sort of went really well. We now have a second data release live. So what I'm showing you on the right-hand side here is, is a sort of cutout of one of the um, most sensitive pictures to ever taken with a radio telescope, pretty much. Um, so this is of the Laduma field, which is uh, part of the sky, which has been really extensively observed observed by now by meerkats, but also historically by things like Hubble um, and lots of X-ray telescopes, uh, Chandra for one. Um, and we have really, really deep observations of these. We have 19 of them, which are currently live. And you can see just sort of how many interesting things there might be in this picture. There's a couple of interesting galaxies you can see on the right here. These sort of lobe structures are really interesting. Um, we've got 19 of these pictures. I'm just going to play astronomical spot the difference to see you know, what's interesting there. Um, I've got a couple of QR codes at the bottom here, but I will, um, you, you don't need to take any of those, but I will, I will show the, the demo in a second. And as part of this second data release, we wanted to, to use this citizen science platform as a tool for engagement. So earlier in the year, I got a chance to come down to um, down South Africa and um, work on a project with Sereo, which is what I'm going to talk about briefly now. Um, so with Sereo, uh, I got a chance to visit Carnarvon, 
uh, which you can see on this map here, which is about an hour and a half drive from the Meerkat site. Um, and as part of National Science Week, we ran a project there with some students from Carnarvon High School. Um, the students came down to, to Cape Town after I'd been to visit them. Um, and we did sort of three days of learning about the citizen science platform, learning about the astrophysics and speaking to our current students um, in, in Cape Town. So current honors and master students about what it's like being a scientist and, and you know, how you can do that and the sort of interesting um, interesting work that we do and, and what it can lead to. Um, so we showed them around. So I think here's Christian showing them around the um, the domes at SAAO. So they really enjoyed that, which was great to sort of show them some of the fantastic um, history history that's on the site. And then here's at the bottom here is the students at the Soreo uh, Operations Center um, uh, just over the road. Um, and they all really loved this. It was a great chance to see you know, the inner workings of the telescope. Um, and I really hope that this this sort of was really fun for these kids and, and they seem to really enjoy it. They were really engaged with the project and did loads of work on the platform. And, you know, I, I think it's important to, to give back to the community in the sense that there's this world-class facility that's basically on their doorstep living in Carnarvon and giving them direct access to science on that telescope. Um, I think that's a really, you know, crucial thing to, to be able to provide to people. And we've also had some fantastic work done uh, from the IAU's Office of Astronomy for Development um, to translate the project into lots of South African languages. So um, I'm actually currently uploading those to the site. Um, so so many thanks to Sibilelo Mokapela for helping with that. Um, so that's really fantastic to be able to share it in, in more languages than just English um, and provide you know, more access to, to fantastic you know, um, science with a fantastic telescope to more people. Um, and um, I have been and will continue to do more um, sort of sessions with Soreo um, and, and sort of try and sort of share this more widely sort of to try and push the engagement because I think you know in addition to doing fantastic science which it does do we can also you know um, as I said, sort of provide uh, science access to to people in a way that is you know pretty unique um, in my opinion um, so, so that was that was really fantastic so um, I said we did this this with the volunteers we also had a bit of um, sort of press coverage which has been been really good so you can see um, I had a sort of article written about um, about this this citizen science just before we uh, we sort of did the did the the, the uh, project with those learners from Carnarvon. We got a big big spike in volunteers here. So what this this histogram is showing you is how many clicks were there on the website on any given day, and you can see there's a, a sort of spike there. And then here, where I've sort of highlighted these three days here, that's when the when the students came in and did a bunch of classifications with me, and they all, they did over three thousand themselves, which was just amazing. Um, as well as getting existing uh, volunteers involved. Um, I see she catch us on, on online and uh, she's very kind enough to, to speak to me um, and let me uh, be on, on her uh, podcast on, on, on Fine Music Radio, which is really fun. Um, I'd, I'd never done that before, so that was really cool to do. And we had an uptick in, in volunteers from that. Um, I also spoke to, to Daniel Kunama um, for uh, the, Burst from, uh, for the um, Cosmic Savannah podcast. And you see the massive spike engagement from that as well so it's really cool to sort of be able to share this and 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 push it in, in different avenues um and, and that you know translates not only into engaging with uh, um with people but also you know to the to the, the clicks on the site which i'm very very grateful for um is the point i'm making um so this is all going really well um and we're going to continue doing more citizen science with as much meerkat data as we can and you know, i hope to do this um for for the foreseeable future um I'm not really going to talk too much about the uh, machine learning for now, but we are, are working on machine learning as an interesting tool for, for digging through the data and using what the volunteers have said to see if we can use the machine learning methods um, to do it at scale and with things like the SKA, where data is just going to get you know, uh, enormously overwhelming. Um, but that's sort of everything I wanted to uh, talk about pretty much. So I, I thought I'd show you the, the site and, and give you a sort of... Uh, uh, a quick tour of it and show you what it's like. Um, so when you go to the homepage, hopefully that's still that's still visible. Um, this is the the homepage here. So um, on the Zooniverse website, if you just type in "burst from space meerkat" in Google, it should come up. Um, and this is our homepage, so you land and you get a sort of sense of uh, what's going on. So who's been talking about the project? The recent things they've said on the talk forum. And at the bottom here are some of the statistics. Um, so how many people have done how many things? We've had. 181,000 classifications um, on our subjects, which is just you know nuts to me that that so many people have have helped me do this much science. 
Um, the volunteer number here, this is the number of registered volunteers. We all have lots of people as guests as well. So this number is actually more like double this, um, more like 2,000 people take part, which is, which is again, amazing. Um, and from here, you can sort of learn about the project um, and learn a bit about the things you're looking for. And there's all sorts of uh, text there. Um, learn a bit about some of the team, some of the results we, we found. So I showed this, this plot earlier to, to you all here. Um, you know, FAQ, all this kind of sort of contextual um, reading of, of, of the project. But the main thing to do is just press get started um, and it jumps you right into the, into the platform. Um, I, I've already obviously logged in many times, but when you log in for the first time, you'll get a, uh, this sort of tutorial box will, will show up um, and it'll walk you through sort of what I've told you guys about having um, an image that you're they're looking to, to, to classify and uh, the light curve, um, which you can see here. So you can see I actually showed this example earlier. Um, so you know it'll talk you through how those work um, and, and what we're going to show you and a couple of the common issues where, where sometimes the data doesn't look perfect. Um, and then just to get on with it, basically, if you, you know, and get involved, if you want to ask any help, ask for help, you, you can on the, on the forum board or, or send uh, me or any of the other researchers a, a question. Um, so that's one of the things ways we can help. There's also a field guide, which you click on the left here and gives example, which is gives some examples of the kind of things that we're looking for. For example, sort of stable sources. So again, you see these things where there's you know quite large uncertainties. You can't see if something's truly varying. So we can't say it's into a transient or variable. Some data is pretty sparse. We just have like two observations in, in some areas. So that's you know not going to be uh, very easy to, to, to analyze. And lots of these extended blob structures um, that I sort of showed a few of already. Um, and those are the things we don't particularly want. Um, they're useful for lots of other science, but um, so I've actually been considering sharing those with, with other astronomers for what they might want. We don't want to see sort of weird artifacts around bright sources, although those are quite hard to find. So I, so I, I'm not going to emphasize that too much. Um, and then the transients and variables that we're after. So these clearly changing light curves going up and down. Um, and again, this gif of that, that star that I showed earlier. Um, and that's sort of it um, uh, for the project. It's, you know, we try and keep it as, as, as simple as we can. Um, and um, yeah, so, so if you want to get involved, I'm more than happy to share this link around. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically everything to the site really. Um, that's pretty much everything I had to say. I'm happy to discuss and take any any questions. And hopefully, you know, I've I've convinced you that there's lots of amazing um, science that we can find with Meerkat, um, and it's you know a fantastic facility for finding all these interesting astrophysical things out in space. And that citizen science is a great way to find them um, through with huge quantities of data. Um, you know, human eyeballs are you know an invaluable tool, um, and I'm really grateful for the volunteers we've had and and any we, we continue to have. And hopefully, you know, I've, I've shown you it's also a great way to engage people in this great work. Um, and you know, anyone can get involved from anywhere if you have an internet connection, basically. Um, yeah, so so I'll I'll, I'll stop, stop talking there and, and happy to chat for as long as you want. Thank you very much indeed for the interesting presentation, Alex. Um, the floor is open for question, and I see there is a hand up already by uh, Shami. So yeah. Shami, just unmute yourself. Hi, uh, hi, Alex. Uh, hi. And all, I hope you can hear me. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, I've been using the Birth from Space project for about two months now, and uh, hey, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, it's quite easy to use. I find it quite easy to use, and uh, some of the things that you are that you do end up finding is quite exciting. You know, you go through quite a lot of data, and then you find something quite exciting. So great work there. Thank you. Um, I just had one question, and that had to do behind why are there such large uncertainties or error bars mm. of the light curve. Yeah, this is a really good point. Yeah, so I've shown a few examples. I'm sure you've seen many more if you've been classifying lots. Um, so generally, there are larger uncertainties on these sort of measurements of the brightness when things are fainter in the sky. So, so we'll be more sure if something's bright and far less sure if it's really faint. Um, and with these images, particularly in this most recent data release, because they're really, really sensitive observations, we catch, you know, um, the sort of natural distribution of things in the sky is that there's a few bright things and there's lots of mediumly bright things and many, many, many really faint things. So it might just be that there's 
you know, lots and lots of these very faint things that we can only see with these really deep observations. Um, because they're quite faint, you end up with these quite large uncertainties. Um, so that, that, that then gets quite hard, you know, because we've got lots of these things that might be too uncertain to tell, uh, which is was one of the challenges. Um, but that's, that's, I think, what is mostly causing these things. They're very faint, so it's hard to be sure exactly how bright they are. Um, and there's lots of the faint things because, um, yeah, that's, that's sort of how, how, the, how they end up on the sky. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering my question. Yeah, th thank you so much for getting involved. I mean, that, that's obviously here. Yeah, I'm loving it. <laughs> uh, I see there's a question from Arthur on the chat, which is, ah, yes. what's the minimum and maximum number, roughly speaking, of sources to examine that makes a citizen science effort worth it? Oh, this is a good point. So I guess this is in, in relation to, you know, if you're thinking of, if you have lots of, of of science you want you want to do how how best to do it so i mentioned that um uh, this so the, the the amount you need sort of depends on first and foremost how many you know thing bits of data you have so for me it's like nine thousand light curves in the first data release we've got about twelve thousand in the second data release so that's that's lots um but then there's this other component of how many people you have look at each one so we had 10 people look at each one um so that, you know that means it takes 10 times as long um, but ensures a slightly more um, uh, robust sort of answers. Um, some of the really um, uh, established citizen science projects have 40 people look at each one. So they might have the same amount of data as me, but they have, you know, four times as many people look at each thing. So it takes, um, you know, takes that bit, bit longer or requires that more engagement. So I guess it, it sort of depends on the science case. If you think it's going to be a bit uncertain and you need many votes on each thing, then you know you you maybe wouldn't need as many individual things to look at. Whereas if you but if you've so if you only have, but if you have only you know five or ten people look at each one, um, in my experience, you know people have loved getting involved, and I, again I'm really grateful for that. So you know you end up running dry of data quite quickly. Um, but I'm happy to chat more about um, the specific case of if if you have uh, how much data you have and you know how many people you think might get involved in this kind of thing. So I'm happy to chat about that if you want as well. Um, I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, you briefly mentioned machine learning. Yeah. Um, do you see machine learning making human volunteers obsolete anytime soon, and why or why not? Yeah, so I think um, yeah, I, machine learning, you know, there's a lot of hype around it in a lot of ways, and um, I, try, I try not to buy into too much um, popular hype about it, but it is a fantastic tool for um, dealing with large data sets and, and has shown real promise in uh, lots of areas of, of astronomy. Um, I don't think that humans will ever be replaced, certainly not in, in the aspect that, of citizen science that I've been doing. I don't think that machines will be able to replace humans, certainly not in the next 10 years in any way. Um, for one thing, you know, to do a lot of machine learning, you need to train your, your machine learning models. And to do that, you need um, to know what you're training it with. You need to have a sort of sample you understand to train your machine learning model. And to do that, you need, you know, humans to have labeled that data. Um, so again, you know, unless you want you to, you know, a single person to label all of it, then citizen science is a way to do that. Um, but furthermore, um, machine learning, as I said, is, is great when dealing with lots and lots of data, um, but it might not necessarily be good at some of the nuances that human pattern recognition are really good at. So there are a few examples in um, where Machine learning can find things that are sort of weird or anomalous. Um, so I've actually worked on a, sort of a, some anomaly detection models, uh, and that you know the machines are you know very comprehensive, but they're a bit sort of uh, dumb in some way in the sense that the things they find to be anomalous might not necessarily be astrophysically interesting. So you know they might say something is a potentially really interesting source in the sky, but actually if you human look at it and, and take one glance and go, actually, no, I know that that's actually caused by an issue with the telescope or, or something that the machine learning doesn't know. Um, so I definitely think there's a discussion to be had about how to prioritize when to use the machine learning to get through, churn through big amounts of data and how to prioritize um, your human attention, which is a very you know valuable and, and, and useful resource. Um, but I, I don't see machine learning taking over and, and making citizen science obsolete in any time soon, um, which I think is, is good, yeah. Thank you. Are there any questions? Ketchum. 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 Oh, Ketchum, yeah. the hand up. Ketchum, over to you. Yes, and there's also, I think, another one in the chat. 
Um, mine's oh, yeah. a good question. That was a, a great talk. Thanks very much, Alex. It Thanks. was really, really, uh, really terrific. Really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, what visualization tool did you use? For those uh, the radio astronomy images. Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, I mean, I'll just go flick back to some of them, but I'll, I'll leave it on this pretty one, pretty one here um, of of one of our fields. One, not the Laduma one, but the uh, others. Just the little ones. With uh, the, like the the purple the, the purple and ochre color map that one there. Yeah. So so these um uh so the way that we sort of had have, have things working in in our collaboration is that all of the images get um taken by my collaborators and I take the images and I uh, run a sort of software um, package on them, which is called the transient pipeline, which sort of does sort of finds where all the things in, are in the image. So all the sort of circles or all, all the dots, um, the source finding, and it sort of records where those positions are. And then I've just written my own scripts that will just take um, the images I have, find where the things are in them and sort of cut out a little section of the image and, and save it as a, as a PNG for me to use. Um, um so so i've just made these some scripts in python to make these these sort of little cutouts of the sky um once the images have been made for me if that answers the question i'm not sure yes it does yeah thank you fantastic and yeah i, I see um a question in the chat about um any thoughts on gamifying citizen science and does it promote competition or cheating um so this is a really good point um uh a lot of people sort of internal to the zooniverse sort of development team have, have thought a lot about this and there is this this balance between you want people it to be sort of fun and engaged, but if it becomes too much of a competition, then that can lead to, um, you know, suboptimal results. You can you can imagine if you were giving prizes for people that did the most work, then you know that would push people to, you know, perhaps um, sacrifice quality for quantity, uh, for example. So there are examples of. So I think that's something to, to be careful of. That there are examples of some Zooniverse projects where you have sort of levels of of a project. So you know, and that's more to do with sort of how experienced a volunteer is. So that sort of first level might just be, it does something look like A or look like B. Um, and once someone's confident with that and you've assessed that in some way, then they can you sort of unlock a level two um, where there might be a tiny difference between, between different you know, A type one and A type two, for example, and it sort of gets more more nuanced. Um, so that's that's a way that sort of, um, sort of, yeah, sort of, game type terminology can come into it but i think we, they work quite hard to avoid um making it too uh competitive um or or sort of reward based because then that that might um cause it cause issues i think yeah uh, ben, richard has his hand up hi alex can you hear me yeah i can thanks great that was a great talk thanks very much Tell me, in the beginning, you mentioned that the frequency you were looking at was 1.3 gigahertz. Yeah. Do you happen to know what the bandwidth there is? Yeah, so, so Meerkat has a really um, broad bandwidth, actually. So um, the full full sort of data cubes that we get from Meerkat are bandwidths of about 800, 800 megahertz. Is that right? I think, yeah, centered on, centered on 1.3 gigahertz, and, and about, but it goes down to like 0 0.9 gigahertz and up to about one point seven or something yeah so about 800 megahertz of bandwidth um uh the images that i i've shown are all just all of that frequency sort of sort of put together into one image um you could sort of break it up into an image at the lower end of the the, the bandwidth and a higher end but we've just done the whole the whole bandwidth um in this but yeah about, about 800 megahertz yeah i see okay are the edges of the bandwidth fairly sharp edge or uh, do they have a slow roll off um i think it's fairly sharp although i i I can't say that with complete confidence. Yeah, um, I, I've been lucky enough that a lot of my collaborators do a lot of the, the imaging and 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 sort of data processing before I I sort of get to show it to volunteers. So um, I have to double check. But I think they're fairly fairly sharp. I mean, there are then there is then a receiver at lower frequencies and now one at higher frequencies for 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 that. But I think the edges of the bands of I, I think are fairly sharp. I see. Okay, great. Thanks. I've got one more question. In the early days of radio telescopes, when you were transitioning to images, mm. did you ever have to take images of with optical telescopes of known sources that were fairly close by, so you could almost truth them with the radio telescope images? Ah, uh, historically, yeah. So I, I think um, some of the some of the first uh, radio sources, were, you know, are very very very, very distant um, quasars, and I, and and sort of finding out what those were was one of the. Um, 
sort of early hints of how how big parts of the universe were and and um you know i remember hearing stories of you know back in the 1960s or so when there were some of the first radio telescopes for example in cambridge um so when i say i've talked i've talked about these radio telescopes and then i've sort of looked in catalogs to find optical counterparts for example back in the day you used to have you know physical um you know uh, star charts of the sky and then overlap them with sort of radio contours and have to do it sort of by hand um to see if anything lined up so um i think in the early days i think this was certainly a thing of you know what optical sources are coincident or, or causing the same radio sources for example um yeah which has been, it's been a lot of a lot of history in that i think yeah okay great thanks cheers um see no more hands up so uh, I'll extend to the end of my presentation.